Antonino, Sarah, good morning. It's good to have you in the house of the Lord today. Good morning, Pastor. So we welcome you and um, look forward to hearing once again more of, of your vision, what God has laid upon your heart and where you see that taking you. Would you share with us in these next few moments? And then we can purpose in our hearts a love offering. And then I'm looking forward to the word you have to share with us this morning. Incredible. Incredible. I'm, I'm just so thankful. And um, I, I, before, before I get started, I'm just so thankful for this congregation. I, I don't know how clear I sound um, on Zoom. Do I sound? You're, ve you're very clear. We hear you loud and clear. Perfect. That's awesome. Well, I just want to start by uh, uh -oh. oh, I just <laughs> sorry. I just want to start by thanking uh, Pastor and Sister Tilly for this opportunity to to connect with you, even if it's across the world, and I. Uh, I'm just so thankful that you guys are allowing me to just share my heart and what God has put and put on me and what I believe he's going to be doing in the next season. Um, and I really feel like Calvary, Calvary Assembly of God has truly raised me up, prayed me up, trained me, gave me leadership roles, gave me worship roles, and given me so many opportunities to grow and learn. And, and I really feel in this season like you guys have trained me and now you guys sent me out out of calvary assembly of god and i just also want to thank the congregation and all the people there because because you guys are just humble enough to allow young people young young leaders to lead worship and to preach and to teach and you guys are willing to listen to somebody like me. <laughs> so I, I'm just so thankful. I'm so honored. I'm so humbled. And I'm glad to be doing this. Uh, just, just some things. Um, but before, before I, I get into to uh, contend, I, I was kind of going to, I don't know, if Pastor, if you have anything else to share or, or read, but I was going to kind of get into my message and talk about contend at the same right. time. All right, so you're gonna you're gonna put them together, okay? So um, should we just receive um, or for purpose to re to receive an offering for Nino and then let him continue preaching? We could do that. Okay, we'll do that. Father, we just come to you, God, then, and ask Lord that you would move upon us, Lord Jesus. You know the ministry you're yes, calling Lord. Nino and Sarah to, Lord God. We come with our our love offerings, our gifts. We know, Father, that Nina will share more on how we can participate. But, God, we come to you wanting to bless on mm -hmm. this day, Lord, to send, Father, to empower, not only in prayer, but financially, God. And so we just ask, God, that you would uh, receive the gifts that we bring, Lord, for this ministry on this day. And we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. and amen. So we turn it to you and Sarah. And share with share with us the word and your 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 plan, your vision for what God's doing in your life. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. I would love it if you can open up or turn on your phones or whatever you got where the Bible's at to Matthew 21, um, 21, 13. And it reads. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. My house shall be called a house of prayer. And many of you guys know I've been in Colorado, Colorado Springs, Colorado over the past six months. And there I did their school, their internship, and recently got put on staff as a missionary and well, we're considered missionaries there. And, and during, during my time, the burden of building a house of prayer, raising up houses of prayer is essential for this hour. 
the, the hour that we are at, what the church needs to do is not do more outreaches or more preachings and teachings or have more events. But I believe the church needs to rise up a house of prayer because God calls his house a house that prays. But I believe God has not called me just to be a missionary and to do it alone. But I believe God has called me to do it with my fiance, Sarah. He has called me my to be a wife, Sarah, and, and I believe God has called me to, that we are missionaries and we're going to be running and doing this thing together. I know many of you guys met her, um, but we recently got engaged in November, or last, last November, um, but And so just a little bit more about Contend. At Contend, we desire to see America turn back to God. We are burdened with the youth of, uh, youth of America. And I know that seems like a broad statement that we want to see America turn back to God. But we, we want to see the young people turn America back to God. In Malachi 4, it says, turning the hearts of the children back to the Father. We believe turning the hearts of the children, the Generation Z, back to God. This is our main calling on Contend, that we want to go on, reach the young people. We go on college campuses to touch the youth, to, to see America turn back to God. And, and, and it's some statistics about um, um, Generation Z, this, re, this upcoming generation, that it is actually the, the most lost generation. Only 4% actually profess to be Christians. But that's when God can break in. Because we know that there's no programs, no church events, nothing can turn the heart of America back unless God pours out something stronger, which is his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And this month, like I said, I recently joined Contend this January, and this, just this first month has been incredible. I truly didn't understand what we did until we had our first event in January with the CLS event, having over 100 kids show up. Actually, Moses, he's online right now, I see. And um, Moses and some North Point Bible College kids came out. And literally, the, a bunch of kids from different colleges from all across America came into the church basement. And we prayed and we worshiped and we, we cast vision on what God is trying to do. And the two other events we did was we traveled first to New York City in Lower Manhattan and in Orange California. Uh, Orange County in California. And just a quick testimony about, about California. Our, uh, our team actually projected that we would have about 100 young people show up. But one of the leaders who was mobilizing for that, that event said, if 200 college students show up tonight, then truly it was a move of God. The hand of God was on the event. And that night, it was completely packed out. The, the, the event was completely packed out. And after we did the registration and we counted how many people showed up, it was truly a move of God. Over 200 or about 200 young people and college students showed up crying out for California, calling upon the name of the Lord, asking God, give, send mercy instead of your judgment. Send mercy to America. Turn the hearts of the children. Turn back uh, this next generation back to you and honestly we are we are just warming up we are actually going to be stepping onto 80 college campuses we're projected to step on 80 college campuses this year me and sarah and a few other leaders are going to be leading a southeast tour and bella and i see bella's actually online she's actually going to be on our team but we're going to be stepping on about 10 uh college campuses in the next coming weeks in georgia and in tennessee um, but the main messages that we carry, that uh, the main two messages that we carry at Contend. Uh, oh, and all, all, to, all together, uh, we were so surprised. We, we gathered and impacted about 400 college students at just three of these events. And we're, we're so excited to go run into more college students and gather more college students. Um, but the two, main, two, the two main messages that we carry at Contend and we give to, uh, to college students is first called the Nazarites. And if you're unfamiliar with the Nazarites, it's actually in Numbers chapter 6, where it reads, if a man or a woman desires 
to set themselves apart, to make a special vow to the Lord. And we tell young people to give up the things of this world, we, we tell them to give up the party scene or the American dream. We tell young people, give up your young years, your youthfulness, and give your zeal to the Lord for, the, for, the, uh, for this next generation, for your college campus. We tell them, be a Nazarite in your generation. Every time God wanted to contest the culture or contest the leadership, or the demonic strongholds, he would raise up men and women and set them apart to be Nazarites, to, to, to fight against what is happening in this day and age. And we believe it. the Nazarites is essential to that. And another message that I will be touching on and preaching on today is raising up houses of prayers. And this is what God has birthed in me and burdened me over the past six months being with content. God has truly taught me how to pray and what it means to raise up houses of prayer in order to contend against those who contend against God. Those who contend, uh, contend against the living God. You first need to raise up houses of prayer. We are believing in, in, in our team. Our team in our vision is believing to turn back the youth of America. And that's not through doing awesome program or programs or having awesome events. We believe only through raising up houses of prayer. If we want to see revival, if God is going to break the principalities, the powers, the strongholds of those days on college campuses, the only way to break those is by having a contending house of prayer. One that prays against against the strongholds, and then you could see revival on the land. But that only happens when you raise up houses of prayer. Amen? Amen. So that, that was a little bit about content, but I'm just going to jump in into the message, and I believe the word of the Lord this hour. And many people want to see this next generation saved. Generation Z touched by God. Generation Z pulled back into the heart of God, but we won't see it by holding, by having nice outreaches, by having a bunch of random events, because Generation Z, as we know, is super consumed by technology. Not a lot of things pull them, but, but we believe the word of the Lord is having a house of prayer. A house of prayer will break those strongholds. And and I would love if you would follow with me in Matthew 21, if you still have your Bible open to Matthew 21. I'm not going to be reading the passage directly, but I'm going to be referencing Matthew 21, 1 through 13. And here, Jesus is getting coming down from the Mount of, Mount of Olives. And as he's coming down from the Mount of Olives, he tells his disciples, go get me a donkey Go get me a donkey that I could ride on. And here Jesus is actually fulfilling the promise of the Lord. He's fulfilling a prophetic word of the Lord. And God in this moment, he says, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. Right? Jesus in this moment is being crowned king. He's being crowned king by God. God is crowning Jesus in this moment. But Jesus is not coming with chariots. He's not coming with horsemen. He's not even being... Uh, being uh, escorted by anybody politically or, or some figure. But here he's coming lowly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Jesus is being escorted. And here Jesus is being, Jesus at this time is getting the royal treatment per se. He's not on a horse or on chariots, but people are crowning him and showering him with praise. They're throwing his clothes on him. So not only God crowns him king, but the people of this day are crowning him king. And they're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus in this hour is being crowned king. And, but it's, it's not, right, like I said, it's not like the governor of Caesar, the Roman government, is escorting Jesus as king. It's not like the Pharisees are escorting him, but it's actually the broken, hurt, the broken people, the hurting, the tax collectors, the sinners that are showering him with praise. The people who are, are sick are showering him with praise. And Jesus sees th this oppression. Jesus sees the brokenness. Jesus sees the hurting. And his first course of action as king 
the first course of action as king. Jesus doesn't gather an army together. Now that he feels like he's a leader, he doesn't get people together and he doesn't go to the Roman government and try to take down Caesar. But he goes into the house of God. He says, my first course of action as king, there's a problem. The oppression actually isn't out here. I see the brokenness. I see the sickness. It's not because of out outside, but it's actually in, in here in the temple of God. And what Jesus does, the first course of action as king, he throws out the, he overturns the money changers. He throws out all the sacrifices. He, he, he throws out all the people who are selling doves. And he establishes as king, his first course of action, he first establishes, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And I believe this is the burden and this is the word of the Lord for this hour because many people, many people believe by filling up events, by having more outreaches, by having more, um, you know, sermons or teachings or programs that we will turn Generation Z back to God. But, but the burden of the Lord, he, he flips over the spirit of the religion. He flips over the sacrifices and he says, my house shall be called the house of prayer as king. I want to establish this first. My house shall be called a house of prayer. And I want to encourage you today that, that though you feel that, and, 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 I, and I love pastor every Sunday that we pray and we cry out to Lord, we intercede for different uh, promises or issues that we may have in our own lives. But I, I want to, I want to burden you today that you do not have to just pray in these four walls, that the spirit of God is not just in these four walls where we're sitting at, but Jesus is burdened. Once again, in, in John two, a similar scene actually happens where Jesus makes a whip he, he's so burdened by the Lord. He makes a whip and he, he, he kicks out all, all the people who are selling sacrifices and overturns the money changers. And he's so burdened by the Lord that he, that he, it says zeal for the house of the Lord has eaten me up. And Jesus and the Pharisees come up to Jesus and they ask him on what authority do you have to do this, but Jesus responds in three days, tear down this temple and I, or, or no, tear down this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. I will raise it up in one day. But the Pharisees then go up to Jesus and say, what are you talking about, Jesus? It took us 46 years to build up this temple. It took us 46 years to build this temple. What are you referring to, Jesus? But Jesus, but it says the disciples remembered that he was not talking about his body. Right. He was not talking about or no, he was not talking about the temple. He was not talking about the church. He was not talking about the four walls that contain the spirit of God. But he says in, in one day, I will raise up the temple. Jesus was referring to his body or the way Paul says it. Or do you not know that you are the temple of the living God where the spirit of the Lord is resides actually in you, not in this temple. And you may feel like, well, I don't pray that much, or I don't like praying, or, you know, praying is not really my calling, or I'm not really good at it, or I don't have enough time. But I want to tell you, God has made you a house of prayer, that you are one who prays. And I want to tell you today that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, right, Jesus doesn't come in with horses or chariots. He doesn't come in stomping on you, on all your ideologies and what you believe, but he actually comes into you, right? Lowly, riding on a donkey, humbly walking, walking towards you. And when he enters in, the first thing Jesus wants to overthrow, the first thing Jesus wants to overturn is that spirit of religion, the spirit of brokenness, the spirit of hurting, the spirit of sickness, the spirit of depression, and anxiety. Jesus overturns all those broken things in your life. And the first thing Jesus wants to establish in you and in me, the burden of the Lord, is that my house shall be called a house of prayer. That you are a house of prayer. I'm a house of prayer, if I like it or not. 
God has wants to establish this in us today, that we are houses of prayer. And if there's this one, one thing, one line that you learn from me today, and his disciples asked him, Lord, would you teach me to pray? Lord, teach me to pray. I want you to just take 30 seconds where you're at and just ask, Lord, teach me to pray. Amen. Amen. And I want to just continue on, on what prayer what prayer does. So what does God, why does God want us to pray? Why does God want us to pray? Is praying for God or is, is prayer for us and what God wants to do through us? Are we just helping God out when we pray? Does God just feel good when we begin to pray? But if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Praying is reaching into heaven and pulling it down to the earth. Praying is reaching into heaven and pulling it down to the earth. When Jesus is teaching his disciples in, in Luke 11, when Jesus is teaching about prayer, teaching his disciples about what prayer is and what prayer does, he says, on earth as it is in heaven. When you begin to pray, the heavens actually begin to open up. On earth as it is in heaven, when you start to pray and cry out to God, Call upon the name of the Lord. The heavens begin to open up and you get to make the earth look like heaven. You make the earth look like heaven when you begin to pray on earth as it is in heaven. But that only happens when you pray. Lord, teach me to pray. This is why God, and, I'm, and this is going to be my second point, and I'm going to really hit... Um, I'm going to really sit on this next point because I believe this is essential to prayer as we begin to feel the burden of the Lord. I hope this, this makes you want to pray, that you desire to pray, that you would want to pray more this hour because God is calling this church to pray. Number two, births God's desires on the earth. Prayer births God's desires on the earth. And this is going to be like more like teaching. So if you're taking notes, so what does that include? What, what, what are God's desires? This includes either dreams, not just from sleeping, right? But dreams like in your heart, what you, what do you want to see? Prophecies, people that, things that people speak in over you, visions, what God has shown you, promises in the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord, of course, we know is, is the Bible. Amen. And, and these are all, of, all ways God communicates with us, and these are his desires. This is what God wants to do on the earth. But how are these desires birthed? How do these desires come forth? Does the word of the Lord, is that, is, once the word of the Lord comes to you, is that a ticket to doing nothing? Just because God said, you know, this is going to happen, that, that now we get to sit around and not do anything? Well, in order for them... In order for God's desires to come to pass, you and I have to pray for the promise to come to pass. Prayer is what births God's desires on the earth. And even though this is the darkest hour, this is the most broken hour, that this is the least amount of people believe in God, the least amount of missionaries are actually going out in this hour, but I believe God has stored up his greatest movement for last, just like Jesus at the wedding day, that he served the best wine for last. Jesus didn't serve the best of wine first, but the best wine was saved for last. But every great move of God is always, always, always preceded by great movements of prayer. But I just don't want to just talk about all these um, ideas, but I'm going to show you in scripture. Even the birthing of the church was in God's heart, right? We all know that the birthing of the church was not man's idea, but the birthing of the church was in God's heart and it was his end time plan. And, and in Joel, in the Bible, Joel talks about in Joel 228, that there would be an outpouring of the Holy spirit. And even Jesus, before he left in acts, he said, wait for me, wait 
because not many days from now, there will, you will be endued with power. You're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's many words. There's many promises that are coming for um, uh, being told to the apostles. But what do the apostles begin to do? How do they wait? Do they, you know, just sit around? Do they go back to work? Do they do worship nights? Do they start evangelizing? Do they start preaching? Do they start doing teachings? But we see the promise of God was birthed for the church in this hour was birthed. The promise of God was pulled down, not because of anything they were doing, but they all decided. And it reads in Acts 1, 13 and 14. And they had entered. They went up into the upper room where they were staying. They all continued with one, one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And, and I want to, and I believe on the day of Pentecost, when it came, I believe that the disciples remembered the words of Jesus. They remembered the words of the prophet Joel and joined together in one accord and said, if we pray, if we call upon the name of the Lord, if we ask the promised Holy Spirit, he will pour him out. How much more will your father pour out his spirit to those who ask? Right? We understand that, that in these 10 days, while they were waiting, and waiting looks like something. Waiting looks like prayer. The church wasn't birthed during a worship night with good music and good food or a coffee hour with awesome outreaches. But they weren't in some fancy building either, right? They weren't in the temple of God where the Pharisees were at. But they were actually, uh, and, and the church wasn't birthed during uh, healing nights or while there was deliverance happening. But the church was birthed with tax collectors with sinners, with the uneducated, with fishermen, people upstairs in some guy's room. In the place of prayer, the church was birthed in the place of prayer. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place, in the place of prayer. And then there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I believe, and I believe that this is a call to all churches and specifically the Calvary Assembly of God. That God has in place Calvary Assembly of God and Pastor could tell you in some random location. But he, he placed you there on purpose. He placed you there for a reason. That God, you know, outreaches are good. Having, um, you know, soup nights and evangelistic uh, calls are all amazing things that we should do. And I'm not against them. But if they're not fueled in the place of prayer then God can't break the principalities and the powers and the strongholds in Southington, in Plainville. And I believe if all this church, if all this church ever does was pray, was intercede, was cry out and call upon the name of the Lord, I believe the church would do its job. That, that would be sufficient for God because God could, could then do the rest. Because we see in 10 days when there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the church was birthed. W them in the place of prayer, not doing anything, just praying and waiting on God. 3,000 people were converted in one moment. And God can draw an entire company. And in one moment, a mega church was born in one day. And they didn't do anything. All they did was pray. Amen. And I want you to ask even right now, Lord, teach me to pray. Lord, teach me to pray. And I want to just give you some tools and, and not tips, but, I, but these are tools that you can use on what prayer looks like and how to pray. And, and that's by first understanding the functioning of the Holy Spirit. And I know... Uh, Calvary Assembly of God and uh, an and AG church, of course, believes the outpouring and the power and, of the Holy Spirit. But I want to I want to be specific and touch on three main points that God desires us to know about his Holy Spirit. And this will help you with prayer. And in Joel 228. In Joel 2.28, it reads, And it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see 
visions. When the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, right? Many things could happen, like speaking in tongues, being healed. And all those things are amazing, amazing, amazing things. But I also want to encourage that the first three things God ever talks about is prophecy. And the reason is prophecy allows you to speak like God. Dreams allows you to think like God and have vision. So you see like God. And all these are desires in God's heart. All these things are desires in God's heart. In Ecclesiastes 5.1. It says, walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than give the sacrifices of fools, right? It's better go, better to go, draw near to the house of God and hear, to understand, to know, to, to have wisdom rather than do a bunch of random things for God. God desires for you to understand. So that's why when he pours out his Holy Spirit and you receive prof, uh, prophecy, if you receive dreams and visions, these are all different ways God can speak to us. God is trying to let us know what he wants to do, that these are my desires. These are all different forms of communication to us. And I want to, and I want to, and I want to speak to you today. I want you, and you might be here, you, you might be here and you might be hearing, well, I received the dream. I have a prophetic word. I desire to see my friends and my family turn back to God. I want to see people that I know in my life who are broken, who are sick, to be healed. I want to see the lost people in my life to turn back to God. And you receive dreams. You receive prophecy. You receive these things from the Lord. But many people might think, well, maybe that's just my own thought. Maybe that was just my own good idea. I want to tell you today, that is an actual, that's actually an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's God trying to communicate his desires and his heart for the lost, for the broken, for the impoverished, the people who are sick, the people who don't know any better, the people who are depressed and anxious. And I want to make one more, one more final point. It's in, and it's in Genesis 13. And a lot of things, uh, a lot of things that I said, but I, I, I want to back it up with, with scripture and with a man who is the father of our faith. The man who is the father of many nations, the father of multitudes, who was very faithless at times, but is known as the father of faith, Abraham. And Abraham, he was 75 years old when he received his call. And he left the land in which he always knew and always had and, left and went to the promised land. He went to the promised land, crossing the Middle East into Jerusalem. And here we see Abraham, he has a dream, he has a call, he receives the vision of the Lord. And it seems impossible. And you may be here and you might have a dream. You might have a vision. You might have a prophetic word that you haven't seen come to pass. And it might seem impossible. But I want to encourage you. Like, like I said earlier, the only way to manifest that dream, that promise, that prophecy to come to pass is continue to stay in the place, uh, stay in the place of prayer. Don't move from that place, even though it seems dry. And here, Abraham, he goes to a random land, but it's dry. It's desolate. It's a wasteland. He's over 75 years old, and his wife is, is at the time, I believe, 60 years old, past the age of bearing children. No way to have children. But he believes that the hand of God can still move. And Abraham was actually a man of prayer. But I'm going to read verses in chapter 13 of Genesis, chapter 13 of Genesis, 14 through 18. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot has separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your de descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land the, through its length and its width, for I give to you. 
Then Abram moved his tent. I want you to pay attention to this verse. The, then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Memre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. And here Abram, he receives an amazing promise. A crazy vision from the Lord, just like we were talking about, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God says, this is my desire. I'm giving you a vision of who I want you to become. And it seems impossible. It seems dry. It seems like it's a wasteland. And you, with a dream and a promise, <laughs> you who have a prophetic word in the word of the Lord, over your life you might seem like it's impossible you might say i've been praying for over five ten years for this promise to come to pass but it has not come to pass but i want to encourage you today i want to encourage the church today it looks like southington is the same but when you begin to pray i promise there's an open heaven over it when you begin to pray i promise god is moving when you begin to set your heart on the word of the lord i promise god is going to continue what he has said he will not stop for the word of God does not come back void, but it's alive and active. Don't give up on the promises of God. And we see Abram. He sees it's desolate. He sees it's a wasteland. He sees that it's broken. But in that moment, he builds an altar. He says, this is impossible, impossible. But he builds an altar of the Lord and he moves his whole family there. And when you build an altar of the Lord, if you look at the chapter before, it's, it's referencing that Abraham called upon the name of the Lord. When you build an altar, Abraham actually is calling upon the name of the Lord. As soon as he gets a vision, the first thing Abraham begins to do, right? He doesn't try to start making his promise come to pass on his own strength, on his own will, on his own dime. But the first thing Abraham does is build an altar to the Lord. And he says he begins to call upon the name of the Lord and prays. And we know at, at, at this point, Abraham actually didn't receive his promise right away. He didn't receive his promise right away. But it takes 25 years for the promise of God to come to pass. But I want to show you another verse that alludes to him that he did not leave that place. He did not just go leave where God has placed or stationed him or moved him. But we see in verse Genesis 18.1, if you would like to turn there or write that down, Genesis 18.1. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Memre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Abraham, for 24 years, did not leave. But he stayed before the presence of the Lord. He built an altar and he was determined. He was not going to remove. He received the vision of the Lord, though he fell, though he stumbled a few times. He did not leave that one place. All Abraham did, all Abraham did to, to fulfill the promise of the Lord was he began to pray. He never left the place of prayer. And I want to encourage you today, though, though you, you haven't seen the dreams or the prophetic word or the word, of, the word of the Lord come to pass in your life. Don't leave the place of prayer. Don't leave God's vision. Don't leave God's heart because he will surely fulfill it. He will surely let it come to pass. And God comes up to him and he says, next year you shall have a child named Isaac. And we know that, that Abraham becomes a great nation and we see the promise of Israel. Um, and that God's hand over Israel, even now, even if it looks bad. But, but we see that, that God wants to do something mighty even in, your, even in your life, even with the promises he's given you. But I want to encourage the church that we have to have a spirit of prayer, that my house shall be called a house of prayer, that you and I shall not leave the place of prayer. Yes, we have awesome callings. We have, we have awesome vision. God has given us great uh, anointings. But I believe first and foremost that we are houses of prayer. And I know I can't really do an altar call, but where you're at right now, if there's a promise or if there's something that you want to see come to pass, I want you to take this next two minutes to pray right now with me. And I'm going to pray with you and for you. 
I just want you to take the next couple of minutes and remember the promises of God. Remember your dreams and desires. And we're going to pray for them right now. If anyone's broken or sick, or if you, if you want to see family, your children, loved ones, come back to the Lord. I want you to pray and call upon the name of the Lord for he promised me. For he promised to do this one thing for me. So I'm going to pray for you. Just please take these next two minutes and just pray for those promises right now. Don't let this moment go by. Don't let this moment go by, but call upon the name of the Lord on this hour. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for, for the dreams and vision that you have for Calvary Assembly of God. For you've given pastors dreams. You have given him a vision for this church. You have given him leadership. And Sister Tilly, I just thank you that you have not just placed people randomly, but you have placed the body of Christ in Southington to intercede and pray, even if it wasn't without amazing crusade outreaches, but it's in the place of prayer. We intercede, Father, for Southington right now in the place of prayer that you would have open heavens and break the strongholds, the principalities, the power of depression and anxiety over Southington, Lord. We thank you that you love the people in the congregation. I just pray right now for those calling on your name, for dreams and promises, for loved ones, for ones that are lost, that, that have strayed away from the path of righteousness. I pray right now that you would pull each and every single person right now, that you would call on their name and that you know them and that you love them, that you desire them. Even in this moment, Lord, I pray if there's anyone struggling with addictions or if they feel defeated or if they feel broken or if they feel like they can't get out of what they put themselves in. I pray that the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. I pray that you would give them the strength even now to break every stronghold in their life. Father. We thank you that these are promises, that this is the word of the Lord and that we will not move from your word even even, even if it looks impossible. We thank you for this time in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, amen. Amen, amen. I, I'm just so, I'm so thankful for this church. I'm so thankful for this opportunity. Uh, I really feel like God is, is going to do something mighty. And, and has so many promises for this church. And I just want to thank you guys again for really sending me out, for, for being like a missionary. For I'm like a missionary at Calvary Assembly of God, and you guys sent me out. And I, I know there's a few ways that you guys could get connected with us. If you go on your, I mean, don't go on your phone right now. <laughs> but if you go <laughs> online and you look up ninoandsarah.com, you can find a lot more with us and you can get connected with us and you can get um, different newsletters and, and we, we will continually send emails. I want you to please, please, if you're interested at all for, for what we do or what I've said today, I want you to get connected with us. Look up ninoandsarah.com, all no spacings, no capital letters, ninoandsarah.com and you can get connected with us. You can partner with us and I'm so thankful and glad I'm sure Pastor Sister Tilly shared with you, but you guys are, are supporting us as a church financially. But I, I, I also want to um, not support. I also want to uh, tell you guys that you guys could get connected with us individually, even partner with us individually. Look at what God is trying to do in this next generation. I'm so thankful that, that for this, this amazing opportunity and what God is doing in my life and in, in this next season in my life. Um, but we also have a ton more information about contend our vision, what God is going to continue to do in us. We have also values updates and we have of course, contact and partner information that you get connect. You can get connected with us. We're also on TikTok, TikTok contend global contend.global is also on TikTok, on Facebook, on Instagram. So these are all just different ways that you can see what we're doing continuously, see what God is trying to do in America and with the young people and stay connected with us as we continue to try to go on college campuses. 
uh, to try to reach this next generation. And I'm just so thankful for this church. Um, in Jesus' name. <laughs> All right, Nino, I have a question for you. Please, Pastor. Well, what I'm what I'm hearing is, and which we've already known. So, what I'm hearing is your your mission, you, your your vision, your mission is to go and establish um, places of prayer on our campuses. Yes, exactly. And, uh, so that's plan one: is to go out and establish these prayer centers, places places of prayer. Once those are established, what are you looking from them? What, what, what do they bear? Once, once they're there, once you have people in, in those prayer meetings praying, what are you looking for? So once, once we get people like praying, so when we, when we do a big event on a college campus, we have these one night events, um, getting people consecrated or either getting people saved. We encourage, we, we try to build up and tell them how, they themselves can raise up a house of prayer on their college campus, how they can do weekly prayer meetings, daily prayer meetings with their friends on the campus and intercede and pray. So we go there and we, we try to, we try to gather young people who desire or who, who have these inklings of wanting to pursue God more. And we tell them how to do that. And that's through houses of prayer. We also give out tons of uh, information on how to do that themselves. We try to empower young students, young people, because that's what young people want to do. They want to be empowered. They want to, they want to trailblaze. They want to pioneer on their own college campus themselves. And we try to empower them by giving them hand, um, by giving us our notes. We have books called prayer guides. We give out prayer guides. We have books on Nazarite DNA and on prayer so that they themselves can read, right? They don't have to copy us and exactly what we do. Um, but we, we tell them to look at these guidelines and that this is what prayer looks like and this is what prayer does so that they themselves can do it on their own campus. Okay, um, so once they're established, I, I, wrote, I just wrote this down. You, you, do, you do an event, basically draw um, people. You have prayer meetings, you bring them to, for those who come out and you reach them and they're praying to pursue. So they're pursuing God. Yes. Um, and then you also give information on teaching them how to pray and how to enter in and how to how to really tap into and get closer to God. Um, one of the thing, one of the things that I think where I'm leading you to is 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 this is this building them up to um, transform their university to reach that university out of this out of these prayer meetings is is this in a with, is, that, is that the fruit you're looking for in the end? Yes, it, that, that is one of the fruits. We're, what we, what we want to see is when there's a house of prayer, right? We believe that there's powers and principalities and ideologies over a college campus, of course. Mm -hmm. It's broken, and, it, and, and there's a lot of people hurting. And, and the only way to break that, right, it's not by doing awesome events, which are, which are good things, but is by having a house of prayer, of, of uh, raising up houses of prayer that the student leaders, students gather together either weekly or daily. They come together and they pray and they contend for their college campus in whatever way that looks like, either praying for more souls, praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, praying for revival to happen on their campus. And so, so that, that is, that is the fruit that we're looking for on these campuses. Amen. Cause it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit says the Lord of hosts. Amen. And we, the church, the church overall has to get back to that philosophy. Amen. We all, we all know that for sure. And, um, and I, 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 I love to hear, I love to hear your vision. I love to hear your heart. Um, because what I hear is I hear someone from from that from your generation rising up and wanting to see the spirit of the living God set loose um, mm -hmm. to to reach to reach your generation because your your generation is not going to be reached by all kinds of events and that's already been shown to be true the wow, statistics yeah, yeah. Bear, the statistics bear that out uh, churches all over America have long since figured out 
They're not reaching their college campuses by events. Um, but um, they, it has to be through, I, and I understand, it has to be uh, through a base of prayer and breaking down the strongholds that are on that campus so that um, that group that's praying can make an impact and roads into the people on that campus so they can be changed lives. That's what, that's what my heart is for. And Amen. in the end, I, I want to see changed lives. Amen. I want to see Generation Z become Generation Jesus. Come on. Amen. That's good. It, they, a, it happened in the 70s. It That's can good. happen in the, in the 2020s. Wow. Why wow. not? Amen. God is able. That's Amen. good. God is able. So I'm going to ask the congregation. I don't know how much of it you will hear, but I'm going to come. I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to ask the congregation to come up. and, and um, yes. So I just want to be sure you know that uh, what we handed out was a uh, uh, printout from Nino's newsletter, and it includes there the website that he talked about. We're also going to send that out electronically so that they all they need to do from email is to click on the link, it'll take them there. Um, and uh, um, if you have a gift to give today, um, you can use the information center back there and, and just drop the check in there, um, and the church will be sending a check. Um, and we're really looking uh, to take on Nino and Sarah in this mission and to support them in prayer and to support them financially um, and, uh, and be a sending church. Amen. Right. Amen. So we'll be, we'll, we're looking to be um, supporting them on a monthly basis Amen. Uh, Amen. As, a, as a missionary that we're sending. Amen. Amen. Um, so, but I want you to come down because I want, I want Nino to be part of this and, and I'm asking you to pray for them that whenever we have a, a guest come to our church, they do all this ministry and they minister to us. They share the vision. They share, they share what God's put on their heart. And in the end, I always want us to pray for that missionary, that evangelist, that person, because they're going from here to continue what God's calling them to do. So I want us to pray for Antonino and Sarah and the, the, the missions. If you want to, if you feel like you want to, you know, keep distance, uh, and you then stay on the on the edges or however in, in the first two rows of pews. And Lynette, you guys are, are close enough if you want. Um, in the name of Jesus, I the reason I'm asking you to come up is because I want Nino to hear. And there are microphones around this pew, this pew, this pulpit. So, Lord Jesus, we just come before you and we pray for Antonino and we pray for Sarah. Yes, Lord. We have thrown them out And now it's time to send them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, would you open up these doors? Lord, would you go before them? So that houses of prayer can be opened on campuses all over this country. That people will be drawn in to want to seek. People will be drawn in to begin to pursue you. With all of their heart they will pursue you. That there will be once again a passion for you. On our campuses. In the name of Jesus. That the generation rising up right now. Will become a generation for Jesus. Yes. Yes, Lord. Lord, that we would see a flip on this 4%. It is yes, a horrible low percentage. The Lord change. We want to see once again the majority of our young people coming to know you and loving you and living you for you and grabbing a hold of you and seeking you with all their heart. Let there be a shakeup all over this nation. Let prayer meetings rise up. Let prayer go forth. Let there be a breaking of the evil and the, and the bondages that are on our campuses. Let there be a breaking of the bondages that are on our young people. Free them from the, the things in their mind and the things in their spirit and the things in their heart that keep them away from you. We rebuke this in the name of Jesus. We rebuke all that the devil is trying to do. We rebuke, for, we rebuke the, the attempt to keep this generation from you in the name of Jesus. And we ask, Lord, for a special anointing. A special anointing on Antonino 
and on Sarah, that when they go forth and wherever they go, the serpent's head is crushed. Closed doors are opened. And the spirit of the living God will go forth before them. And when they open their mouth, they speak for the name of the Lord. When they go forth, they speak the word of the Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. I pray this in Jesus' name. I keep them close to you, Lord. Keep them close to your side. Oh, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Marco, this is your, your elder brother going into the ministry. He's, I'm going to ask you to close in prayer. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for Nino and Sarah. That as they go into marriage, as they go deeper into intimacy with each other, that they would not grow stagnant with you, God, but that they would keep a zeal and a fire in their hearts, burning, not just for one another, but for you, God, that they would not grow stagnant in the name of Jesus. In Jesus, their desire is to see young people grow, to see young people set on fire by your words, Lord. So I just ask you, in the name of Jesus, that you would help them grow, that you would strengthen their minds in the name of Jesus. And Nino, as Abraham desired generations, the words that you speak will go down through generations in Jesus' mighty name. Generations will come from the words and the missions that you go to in the name of Jesus. Do not go stagnant. Do not grow weary. God is with you, and may the Holy Spirit move mightily through you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the mission that you have set on their heart, Lord. Thank you for the words that you have put on their heart to share with us today, Lord. Bless them beyond all measure that any man could contain them, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, let your fire arise deeper within them. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 Wow, this is a this is a powerful moment, I gotta say, for me to to two Marino brothers just praying and crying out to God and seeking the face of God. I I, I just I can't know what to say except it just does my heart good. Um to just know and seeing the hand of God and um may the Lord go with you. Amen. 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 Amen.